Chapter 5 Creating a Culture of Giving Read by Stephen Fry, an English actor, comedian and writer We have just seen that there are several aspects of human psychology that make us less likely to help people in extreme poverty, especially if they are not conspicuous to us as particular individuals. Can we combat these traits, create a culture of giving that lessens their impact and increases our willingness to provide assistance where it will do the most good? Yes, we can. Here are some of the approaches that have been shown to work. Getting it into the open. If our sense of fairness makes us less likely to give when others are not doing so, the converse also holds. We are much more likely to do the right thing if we think others are already doing it. More specifically, we tend to do what others in our reference group, those with whom we identify, are doing. And studies show that the amount people give to charity is related to how much they believe others are giving. Psychologists Jen Shang and Rachel Croson used a funding drive for an American public radio station to test whether the amount that callers donated varied when the person answering the call mentioned that a recent caller had donated a particular sum. They found that mentioning a figure close to the upper end of what callers generally gave, to be precise, at the 90th percentile, resulted in callers donating substantially more than a control group not provided with this information. The effect was surprisingly enduring. Donors who were told about another member's above-average contribution were twice as likely to renew their membership a year later. Those receiving this information by mail reacted in roughly the same way. A similar effect was seen in a study carried out at a Swedish university in which some students were told that 73% of school attendees had contributed to a charity helping children in Uganda. That information boosted the number of students donating from only 43% to 79%. Telling them that 73% of students throughout Sweden, rather than just at their own university, had donated also resulted in an increase, but only to 60%. So, at least for Swedish students, local norms have a greater influence than national ones. On the other hand, a separate study found that providing information about how many hours someone else volunteered for a charity had no effect on the number of hours for which the recipient was willing to volunteer. These studies suggest that letting others know about our giving is likely to encourage them to give. Yet we don't think well of people who boast about how wonderful they are, and talking about how much we give to good causes can easily sound like doing just that. That concern is boosted, at least for Christians, by the passage in the Gospel according to Matthew that describes Jesus as telling his followers not to sound a trumpet when we give to the poor, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honoured by men. Instead, Jesus advises, we should give so secretly that not even our left hand knows what our right hand is doing. Then we will be rewarded in heaven rather than on earth. It's natural to think that if people are motivated only by a desire to be honoured by men, that is, to build a reputation for generosity, they are not really being generous, and will not be generous when no one is looking. Similarly, today, when people give large sums with a lot of fanfare, we may suspect that their real motive is to gain social status by their philanthropy, and to draw attention to how rich and generous they are. But does this really matter? Isn't it more important that the money go to a good cause than it be given with pure motives? And if by doing the equivalent of sounding a trumpet when they give, they encourage others to give, isn't that better still? Jesus was not the only advocate of keeping donations anonymous. 
the 12th century Jewish thinker Maimonides drew up a celebrated ladder of charity in which he ranked different ways of giving alms. For Maimonides, it was important that the recipient not feel indebted to the donor or be publicly humiliated by the need to accept charity. Hence, giving when either the donor is known to the recipient or the recipient is known to the donor ranks lower than giving anonymously and without knowing the recipient of the gift. Almsgiving was local, which makes this concern more understandable. The donor and the recipient lived in the same community and may have crossed paths in daily life. But in an age of global philanthropy, the risk of the recipient being burdened by a feeling of indebtedness to a particular donor is far less significant and is outweighed by the importance of developing a culture of giving. Admittedly, making sure that everyone knows about one's donations can be taken to extremes, as the New York Times theatre critic Charles Isherwood observed when he attended the opening performance at the new home of the Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, D.C. The building is Sidney Harmon Hall, but the naming doesn't stop there. You enter through the Arlene and Robert Cogod lobby. From there, you may choose to ascend to the orchestra level by taking either the Morris and Gwendolyn Kayfritz Foundation Grand Staircase West or the Philip L. Graham Fund Grand Staircase East. Should you arrive with time for a drink before the curtain, you can linger near the James and Esthe Adler Orchestra Terrace West or the less personal-sounding American Airlines Orchestra Terrace East. And don't forget to check your bulky outerwear at the Cassidy and Associates coat room before entering the Landon and Carol Butler Theatre stage to watch the performance. Isherwood laments that this philanthropic graffiti cuts against the ideally selfless spirit of giving in order to provide a public good. He doesn't ask why people with an ideally selfless spirit would be giving millions for a grand new theatre in the capital of one of the world's wealthiest nations. That may be too subversive a thought for a theatre critic. In any case, since we know that people will give more if they believe that others are giving more, we should not worry too much about the motives with which donors give. Rather, we should encourage them to be more open about the size of their donations. By making it known that they give a significant portion of what they earn, they can increase the likelihood that others will do the same. If these others also talk about it, the long-term effect will be amplified, and over a decade or two, the amount given will rise. The need to be public about how much one gives, and not simply about the fact that one is giving, was revealed by a survey finding that 75% of American donors with a household income above $80,000 think they give more than average, whereas in fact 72% are giving less than the average. Strength in Numbers, Pledges and Giving Communities In 2007, Toby Ord was a graduate student in philosophy at Oxford University. He had read my Famine, Affluence and Morality article and decided to calculate how much good he could do for others over the course of his life. First, he calculated how much he would be able to give away if he set a modest limit on how much he would spend on himself and how much he would put aside in savings for the future, and then donated everything else he earned. He was planning to become an academic, and the pay scale for academics in the United Kingdom is public, so it wasn't too difficult to get a ballpark figure on what he was likely to earn in each year. Adding up his anticipated annual salaries for each year until his retirement yielded the sum of £1.5 million, then worth about £2.5 million. US dollars. 
Toby decided he could live on one-third of that and donate the rest. He then looked around for the most cost-effective way of helping people and found a treatment to prevent trachoma, a common cause of blindness in some low-income countries. The treatment was so cheap that the one million pounds Toby planned to give away over his lifetime would be enough to prevent 80,000 people from becoming blind. Toby was amazed that he could do so much good without earning a lot of money, simply by living modestly. He decided that more people should know how easy it is to make the lives of others better. He founded Giving What We Can, the first of the new wave of organizations promoting what has come to be known as effective altruism. The organization asks members to pledge to give at least 10% of their income to doing good as effectively as possible. Ten years after its founding, it has over 4,000 members who report having donated nearly $150 million and have pledged to give, over their working lives, more than $1.5 billion. Toby himself has donated more than £100,000 to effective charities and is on course for giving away £1 million over his career. If you ask people to pledge to give 10% of their income over their entire working lives, will they really keep that pledge? Giving what we can sees forming a community as a way of making it more likely that those who have pledged will reinforce each other's commitment to giving, as well as sharing knowledge and experience on how to give as effectively as possible. In the first edition of this book, I also ask people to pledge to give to effective charities in accordance with a giving scale, in this edition the details are in the appendix, that, like a progressive income tax scale, asks those who earn a lot to give a higher percentage of their income than those who earn little. A friend helped me set up a website so that people could pledge online, and in a surprisingly short time, more than 17,000 people signed up. Word about the pledge must have reached Bill and Melinda Gates, because in 2010, someone from their office got in touch to tell me that, together with Warren Buffett, they were planning to ask their fellow billionaires to make a moral commitment to give more than half their wealth to philanthropy or charitable causes. Would I be willing, they asked, to be quoted in a press release in support of their approach called the Giving Pledge? I had to think about that, because the Giving Pledge is very broad. It covers philanthropy or charitable causes, which could include not only helping the poor, but also building an opera house that bears the donor's name. I asked why, Given that the Gateses and Buffett themselves were focused on improving the lives of people in extreme poverty, that wasn't part of the pledge. I was told that while it was hoped that many of those pledging would follow the example set by the Gateses and Buffett, they feared that making that requirement part of the pledge would shrink the number of people willing to take it. I accepted that answer, and in my comment emphasized the importance of a public pledge in changing the culture of giving. The Giving Pledge was launched in 2010, with 40 billionaires or billionaire families making the pledge. A line in the media release said that though the Giving Pledge was intended for billionaires, the idea takes its inspiration from other efforts that encourage and recognize givers of all financial means and backgrounds. The pledge isn't just a list by means of which billionaires can show that they are really good people. The Giving Pledge website now states that one aim of the pledge is to shift the social norms of philanthropy toward giving more, giving sooner, and giving smarter. To that end, the Giving Pledge organization provides opportunities for members to come together to hear experts talk about effective giving and to 
discuss challenges, successes and failures, and how to be smarter about giving. By 2019, the Giving Pledge had 204 pledges from 23 countries. In addition to Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett, other well-known pledges include Laura and John Arnold, Nicholas Bergrun, Michael Bloomberg, Mackenzie Bezos, Ray and Barbara Dalio, Ben Dalo, Barry Diller and Diane von Furstenberg, Larry Ellison, Mo Ibrahim, Carl Icahn, Dustin Moskowitz and Carrie Tuna, Elon Musk, Rohini and Nandan Nilekani, Pierre and Pam Omidia, T. Boone Pickens, Azim Premji, David Rockefeller, Sheryl Sandberg, Jeff Skoll, Robert Frederick Smith, Ted Turner, Yu Zhongwei, and Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. The Giving Pledge is an example of how the public actions of one's peers can motivate others to give and give effectively. The co-founders of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, Joe Gebbia and Elizabeth and Nathan Blakarczyk, decided to join the Giving Pledge in 2016 because their growing realisation of how wealthy they were led them to think more explicitly about what they should do with their money. Chesky was impressed by the examples set by Bill and Melinda Gates and by Mark Zuckerberg, as well as by a quote from Buffett to the effect that, for those who are already wealthy, there comes a point at which more money has no benefit to oneself, but it can have great benefit to others. Nor does Chesky have a problem with being public about giving. I've always believed that you should be public about giving, such that you can be very public about your values and what you stand for. If you want to know which super-rich people are the most philanthropic, you can now find the answer in Forbes, the magazine best known for the Forbes 400 list of the world's richest people. At the Forbes 400 Summit on Philanthropy in 2014, Bill Gates referred to a comment from a Middle Eastern magnate about the Quran, saying that the reason to talk about one's philanthropy is that it encourages others to give too. In this spirit, Forbes now publishes a ranking of the most generous among the rich. Let's hope that the existence of a generosity ranking will induce people to compete not only to be near the top of the generosity list, as well as the rich list. Founders Pledge, another organization created to connect and inspire high net worth donors, is a global community of startup founders and investors who have made a legally binding commitment to donate to charity a specific percentage, they choose what that is, of the money they receive following a successful exit from the company, for example, selling it to another company. As with many of the other philanthropic communities, they come together to discuss the different causes to which they might donate and how they could contribute to building a better world. At the time of writing, over 1,200 members from 30 countries have pledged $708 million to charity, with pledges worth $91 million having been already carried out. Entrepreneurs who have taken the pledge include Miguel McKelvey, founder and CEO of the co-working space WeWork, Catherine Minshew, CEO and co-founder of The Muse, a career development platform, and Uma Valetti of Memphis Meats, which is at the forefront of the sustainable cultured meat industry. The growth of effective altruism, known among those within the movement as EA, has led to the formation of EA groups all over the world. I've spoken to many of them, often over a video link. There are groups in the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand in every major European country and in places like Abu Dhabi, Hong Kong and Singapore, providing venues for people to come together to discuss and act upon ideas like those in this book. Local Effective Altruism Network, LEAN, now supports over 350 groups that aim to use reason and evidence to guide their efforts to do as much good as possible. 
The Centre for Effective Altruism runs conferences in several cities that bring people together from all over the world who are interested in being both altruistic and effective. There are student effective altruism groups at universities from Oxford and Cambridge to Harvard and Stanford, and I have spoken over a video link to one at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. One for the World, an organization that encourages students to pledge at least 1% of their post-graduation income to effective non-profit organizations helping the global poor, was started by students at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and now has chapters in 15 other universities, including Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Columbia, Tufts, and the University of Melbourne. On Your Own The support of like-minded people certainly makes it easier to start giving, but it isn't necessary. Andre Smith, a car sales representative in the San Francisco Bay Area, read The Life You Can Save and found something in it that I had never imagined was there. The ultimate strategy for how to stay positive in sales. The strategy is to set aside 5% of the sales commissions he earned for donating to effective charities. By doing that, he says, he is able to maintain discipline at work better than he could previously. He posted a sign on his desk inviting customers to ask about the 5%, and he has now given thousands of dollars to the Life You Can Save's recommended charities. His favorite is Fistula Foundation. He also helps grow the culture of giving by sharing his approach at company meetings. Andre says... Now I sell for myself, but also for others. Every extra dollar I make gets split between me and those in need. It's an awesome feeling. Boris Yakubchik was born in Russia and moved to the U.S. at the age of 11. As a college student working part-time, he read Famine, Affluence and Morality, which helped inspire him to begin making small monthly donations to Oxfam and UNICEF. For his 25th birthday, he created a Birthday for Charity website and encouraged friends to give money to a charity he picked rather than give him gifts. When he learned of Give Well's research, he became even more certain his giving was making a positive difference. He joined Giving What We Can, taking their pledge to begin giving 10% of his income to charity, and for a time ran their Rutgers chapter, through which he met his future wife. Once he started working full-time, he also joined an organization called Boulder Giving, and at one point he gave 50% because others in Boulder Giving and Giving What We Can set that standard, observing that when there's a new norm, it's easier to make the leap. And lest you think Boris was doing this as a high-paid techie, he was not. Giving 50% may seem exorbitant, he said at the time, but I'm keenly aware that as a high school math teacher, my starting salary of $47,000 puts me in the richest 1% of the world's population and in the top 75% of the U.S. wage earners. Even after giving 50% pre-tax, I'm still among the wealthiest 5% of the world's population. In 2014, Boris spoke at TEDx Rutgers about cost-effective charities. He's now back to giving 10%, but aspires to return to 50% before long. He has switched to computer programming, believing that a higher income will make living on 50% more sustainable for the long term. He gives nearly all of the proceeds from sales of a piece of software he wrote to Against Malaria Foundation. Boris is confident that by engaging with interested colleagues, he has helped nudge people towards being more philanthropic and more mindful of how they donate. In my experience, these conversations are friendly and welcome when you share your excitement about the opportunity most of us have to improve the lives of others. The feedback loop is long, 
Conversations you have today might not result in actions until years down the line. Don't be discouraged. I once gave a short talk in my office about charitable giving. It generated a few lively conversations that week. It's been a year, and I still have co-workers occasionally approach me to talk about giving. It's a topic that many people want to talk about, and finding someone who is eager to chat about it is just great. Catherine Lowe wasn't particularly altruistic until about five years ago, when she discovered the effective altruism movement. Then, as a high school physics and science teacher, she came across a podcast, Rationally Speaking, on which I was interviewed, and talked about our moral obligation to help those who are suffering, even if they are far away or of a different species. Catherine says that she found my arguments compelling and was even more inspired by hearing about intelligent, caring people who changed their lives as a result of my arguments and started making significant positive impacts on the world. This motivated her to donate to effective organisations, both those combating global poverty and those seeking to reduce the suffering we inflict on animals. She became a vegan, started a local effective altruism group in her hometown of Christchurch, and co-founded Effective Altruism New Zealand Charitable Trust to enable New Zealanders to make tax-deductible donations to more effective charities. She also began running annual retreats that bring together effective altruists from all over New Zealand and workshops on effective altruism for classes, university clubs, professional associations, and religious and secular groups. Talking to people about effective altruism is very enjoyable for me, Catherine explains, and the most rewarding part is hearing from people later to find out they've started donating to an effective charity as a result of the workshop. Some of her activities in the school where she teaches lead to activities with very tangible results, including student-led campaigns that raised over $10,000 for effective charities, meatless Mondays in the school cafeteria, and the school itself becoming carbon neutral by donating to effective climate charities that offset its emissions. Social Media and growing the effective giving culture. Social media are sometimes responsible for misleading and harmful information, but when it comes to giving, they make it much easier to spread new and beneficial ideas. In the United States, social media contributed to establishing Giving Tuesday, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, as a day on which to donate to people in need and to celebrate giving. The idea began in 2012 as an antidote to Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, which was traditionally the big day for retail sales and huge crowds trying to take advantage of them. As online shopping grew, Cyber Monday, the Monday following Black Friday, became more significant for online shopping, and now that is followed by Giving Tuesday. According to Hashtag Giving Tuesday, over $1 billion has been given globally on this day since 2012. Unfortunately, the correlation between great ideas and ideas that spread rapidly on social media is far from perfect. The Ice Bucket Challenge involved dumping a bucketful of ice and water over a willing victim to raise money for Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. It went viral and brought in a whopping $115 million during the summer of 2014. According to the ALS Association, the funds went to research, $77 million, patient and community services, $23 million, and public and professional education, $10 million, with $5 million going to fundraising and processing fees. ALS is a horrible disease, but it is relatively rare. There are about 80,000 new cases each year worldwide. Although the money raised for ALS research has done some good, it has not resulted in any dramatic breakthrough in preventing or treating the disease. In general, 
donating to fund research on diseases that affect people in high-income nations, as ALS does, is less cost-effective than research on diseases or conditions that only affect people in low-income countries. That's because most research funds come from governments in high-income countries, and most of their funding is for research into diseases that affect their own citizens. Individuals in high-income countries are also much more likely to donate to find cures for the diseases that affect them and their families. So all the remaining low-hanging fruit in medical research, that is, the research that has the best chance of making a large reduction in the global burden of disease, is in the field of diseases that are largely or entirely restricted to poor people. The $115 million raised by the Ice Bucket Challenge could, if donated to Project Healthy Children, have provided 44 million people in countries such as Malawi or Liberia with 10 years of food-based micronutrient fortification. Given to Helen Keller International, it could have protected the sight of over 85 million children in sub-Saharan Africa with vitamin A supplements. If applied to Malaria Consortium's Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program in Burkina Faso, Chad and Nigeria, which saves lives at an estimated cost of approximately $2,000, it could have saved the lives of 57,500 children. The Ice Bucket Challenge would probably have done more good if it had raised money for one of these charities. Putting a Face on the Needy Connecting Donors to Recipients We have seen that donors typically respond most generously when they feel a connection to the beneficiaries of their philanthropy. To tap into people's greater willingness to help people who are identifiable, the British organisation Foster Parents Plan created a sense of connection by linking poor children in developing countries with foster parents in affluent nations who sent the child money for food, clothing and education. In return, they received letters from their child. This approach avoided all five of the psychological barriers to aiding the poor mentioned in Chapter 4. In addition to the fact that the foster parents were helping an identifiable child, they felt that their aid was not futile, because they got letters from the child telling them what a difference it made, and they were not focused on other needy children they were unable to help. Their responsibility for their child was very clear. If they stopped donating, the child might have to go without food, clothing or education because there was no guarantee that anyone else would step in to help that particular child. Their sense of fairness was satisfied because they were supporting just one child, generally not an especially onerous burden, and they knew that many other people were doing the same. And although the child was far away, the idea that they were the child's foster parents made the child part of their family and helped overcome the barrier of parochialism. So this seemed to be an ideal arrangement for tapping into the feelings of affluent people so that they will help the poor in distant countries. But it comes at a cost, because giving money to individual children isn't a particularly effective way of helping the poor. It doesn't assist families in providing for themselves, and it can lead to envy and dissension if some children get money and others don't. Problems like lack of safe drinking water, sanitation and health care can be addressed only by projects undertaken at the level of the community rather than the family. Foster parents' plan to its credit, did not deny the existence of these problems. That left them with the challenge of making their messaging more honest, while still speaking to the donor impulse of wanting to feel a connection to the charity recipient. To do this, the organisation renamed itself Plan International and shifted to a more community-based approach. It does its best to retain the appeal of the identifiable recipient 
by continuing to invite potential donors to sponsor a child. And it says that donors may exchange letters and photos with and receive updates about a particular child. But donors are told that their donations do not go directly to a sponsored child. Instead, they are combined with other donations to fund projects that are important to the community in which the child lives. Fortunately, we now have technologies that can enable donors to feel connected to people in a community they are helping. Give Directly, for example, has a feed on its website that enables the people to whom they have given cash to provide uncensored feedback on how they've used the money. In this way, donors see some of the people they may have helped, though without any implication that one's dollars are supporting a particular recipient. Against Malaria Foundation's website provides detailed information about its anti-malarial net distributions, along with photos and videos. This level of reporting connects donors with the people and places they are helping, while also displaying the organization's commitment to accountability and transparency. Charities are also using the web to convey what life is like for the less fortunate. UNICEF has created a virtual reality experience that places the donor inside a refugee camp, while the Fred Hollows Foundation has created an online site simulator showing what it's like to be visually impaired. Giving people the right kind of nudge Using an understanding of human psychology to steer behavior in a desired direction is a cornerstone of all sorts of campaigns, from politics to public health and much else besides. Although this isn't always done for noble motives, it can be. One such instance is an approach that has made it possible for some countries to achieve dramatic increases in the rate of organ donation. Could this also be applied to building the culture of giving to combat extreme poverty? In Germany, for every million people in the population, there are only 11.5 deceased people from whom organs may be taken. In Austria, the comparable figure is 25.4. Germans and Austrians are not so different in their cultural backgrounds, so why should more than twice as many Austrians be organ donors upon their death? The difference is explained by the fact that in Germany you must put yourself on the register to become a potential organ donor, while in Austria you are a potential organ donor unless you object. Although other factors play a role, several studies have found that countries requiring explicit consent for organs to be removed after death have fewer organ donors than countries in which consent is presumed unless one explicitly refuses consent. Just as we tend to leave unchanged the factory settings on a computer, other kinds of defaults can make a big difference to our behaviour and in the case of organ donations, save thousands of lives. Even when we are choosing in our own interests, we often choose unwisely. When employees have the option of participating in a retirement savings plan, many do not, despite the financial benefits offered by the plan. If their employer instead automatically enrolls them, giving them the choice of opting out, participation jumps dramatically. This is what Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, professors of economics and law respectively, refer to as a nudge. In their book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness, which advocates using defaults to prompt us to make better choices. The lesson is that often it doesn't take much of a nudge to overcome the apathy that gets in the way of our doing what we know would be best for us. The right kind of nudge, whether it comes from government, corporations, voluntary organizations, or even ourselves, can also help us do what we know we really ought to do. In the first edition of this book, I suggested that businesses should give employees a nudge 
to participate in giving programs by changing the default presented to them. Instead of inviting staff to opt in to donating a proportion of their salary to organizations fighting global poverty, companies can make participation the default, so that, for example, 1% of every employee's salary is automatically deducted and donated to effective organizations helping people in extreme poverty unless the employee opts out of the program. I don't know if my suggestion had any impact, but some Australian companies have since implemented opt-out workplace giving programs, and they are seeing significantly higher participation rates than with the opt-in model. Examples include Bain and Company, Combank, and The Good Guys. If you work for an organization that does not have such a default arrangement, why not propose it? Another situation in which the right kind of nudge could make a huge difference occurs when we write our wills. In the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, for example, no more than 6.5% of wills include a charitable gift. If the templates people use to write a will standardly came with a bequest clause, and if lawyers, as a default, suggested that their clients include an effective charity in their will, more people would save lives after their own life is over. Company giving The giant investment bank Goldman Sachs is at the heart of corporate capitalism, but nevertheless has created a culture of giving by setting up a charitable fund called Goldman Sachs Gives, to which its partners give some of their earnings. Although the percentage of income that the partners give is not public, the fund, which commenced in 2007, has given nearly $1.5 billion in grants and partnered with 6,000 non-profits in 90 countries. Goldman Sachs also has a program matching charitable gifts made by eligible employees who are not partners, as do 65% of Fortune 500 companies, with an estimated annual total of more than $2 billion donated through such programs. According to The Big Give, 84% of people say they're more likely to donate if a match is offered, and one in three says they gave more because of the match. Other corporations allow or encourage employees to give time or money to good causes. Google has set up its own innovative philanthropic arm, Google.org, which in 2017 pledged to give, over the next five years, $1 billion in grants to non-profits around the world, as well as contribute 1 million employee hours volunteering. Pledging to give is spreading among companies, as it is with individuals. Pledge 1% invites companies to pledge to give 1% of their equity, time, product or profit, or any combination of these, to any charity. Led by Salesforce, Atlassian, Rally for Impact and Tides, Pledge 1% has now been taken up by 8,500 companies in 100 countries, donating a total of over $1 billion in a range of resources. At Salesforce alone, donations had, as of 2018, added up to over $240 million in grants, 3.5 million hours of community service, and product donations to more than 39,000 non-profit and educational institutions. Scott Farker, co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian, an Australian software company, says that pledging has given huge benefits to the company and our staff. We've helped hundreds of thousands of children in the developing world. We have this engaged workforce who come to work every day and feel like they're giving back with everything they do. Companies taking the 1% pledge can support any type of cause. Media Math, which develops marketing platforms, has made the decision to focus its pledge on supporting charities that demonstrate proven effectiveness, including three non-profits recommended by The Life You Can Save, Saver, Living Goods, and Project Healthy Children. 
At the other end of the corporate scale from Goldman Sachs, Google and Salesforce is Vivcourt Trading, based in Sydney, Australia. Rob Keldoulis, its founder, began his career as a trader for a stockbroker, a job he describes as working right at the coalface of pure capitalism. It is also, in his view, the most self-serving of all jobs, because unlike people who make products for others to use, traders work only to make money for themselves. For many traders, that doesn't bring satisfaction, even when the pay is good. They need their work to have its own purpose or value, and not just be a means of earning money. So Keldoulis, who describes himself as a small b Buddhist, decided to pursue the Buddhist teaching that by acting for the benefit of all sentient beings, we liberate ourselves. In setting up Vivcourt Trading, he did not follow the standard business path of seeking investors who would subscribe capital and then own company shares on which they would expect dividends or capital growth. Instead, he set up a charitable trust and made it the sole shareholder. That enabled him to raise capital from investors who were willing to act philanthropically and lend money at low interest to establish a social enterprise. At the end of the financial year, 50% of the company's net revenue goes to charity, and the rest goes to the employees. In that way, the employees receive generous bonuses, but they also get a social bonus, the chance to direct an equal sum to charities of their choice. That gives all the employees a purpose larger than themselves. Keldoulis argues that while the corporate sector needs to drive growth and change, it also has a moral imperative to use its vast reserves of money to help find solutions to our social issues. The business structure he has developed does more than increase employee satisfaction. It also eliminates the pressure of shareholders seeking short-term profits and enables the company to take a longer-term view. It is, Keldoulis believes, the kind of sustainable business model that the world needs. Yannick Silva is another entrepreneur with a vision for a sustainable business model that contributes to improving the world. Yannick's story brings together several elements of growing the culture of giving, as an individual, as a group, and as a business. Around 2005, he began donating 10% of his publishing company's profits to charity. Among the organisation he supports is Village Enterprise, which, as we shall see in Chapter 7, delivers a multifaceted programme to support extremely poor people in starting small businesses. In 2008, Yannick decided to pursue his belief that business is a force for good in a bigger way, and founded Evolve Enterprise, an entrepreneurial education company that seeks to make business a lever for making a positive difference to the world. He also started Maverick 1000, an invitation-only group for bringing together entrepreneurs who share his vision. Ten percent of member dues goes to an impact fund. Yannick reports that to date they've raised and donated over three million dollars to a variety of organizations. Maverick 1000 holds events and trips at which members share ideas for improving their businesses, including how to leverage their work for the greater good. In 2015, Maverick 1000 invited Village Enterprise to present their work to the group, and brainstorming sessions led to a fundraising idea called Fund a Village. For $25,000, an individual or company could support Village Enterprise in transforming an entire village. Yannick was so excited about the initiative that he began donating 50% of the initial launch proceeds from a book he had recently written, Evolved Enterprise, to Village Enterprise, and within a short time he raised $25,000, enough to fund 50 new micro-enterprises in a village in East Africa. 
Other Maverick 1000 members and colleagues volunteered their time and expertise to the book campaign, and one of them, Anik Singal, donated $25,000 to fund another village. Anik, who once lived in a luxury apartment in Mumbai just three minutes from one of the city's slums, has sought to grow the culture of giving in other ways as well, including starting an organisation that supports the creation of quality schools in Indian slums. In 2016, he gave a TEDx talk setting out what he thinks we can and should do about poverty. The Next Generation If we want to bring about lasting cultural change, it's important that parents model effective poverty giving so their children see it as a normal part of what decent people do. Talking to children about money and giving can go hand in hand, and according to one study, parents who do so can positively impact their children's philanthropic behaviour. Scott Pape, the author of the international bestseller The Barefoot Investor for Families, subsequently published a family-focused edition of the book to help parents teach kids about money. In it, Pape recommends a three-jam-jar system to help children manage their pocket money. The three jars are labelled splurge, smile and give. And each payday, children have to put a proportion of their pocket money in all three jars. Money in the splurge jar is for day-to-day -day spending, such as movies. The smile jar is for saving up for something important and the give jar is to donate to help others. Young people who come from families without a giving tradition have few opportunities during their formative years to learn how to give productively. It's easy to talk about it in an ethics class, though, so I include it in some of the classes I teach, including my free online course, Effective Altruism, in which I discuss some of the ideas in this book. To give students a hands-on experience with effective giving, I get the students to take part in a giving game. Giving games were developed by John Bihar. Bihar worked at a hedge fund and gave to charity, but did not give much thought to where he was donating. His colleagues happened to include the future founders of the charity evaluator Give Well. When they offered to share their research on which charities do the most good, Bihar was struck by how a simple conversation led him to a giving strategy that was obviously superior to what he had been doing for many years. Later, he wondered if there was a way to replicate and scale up his aha moment about giving. The Giving Game Project is his solution to that problem. Giving games are workshops that provide the experience of philanthropy. People learn by giving away real money, often provided by The Life You Can Save, where Bihar now works. The workshops usually last around an hour, during which participants learn about several pre-selected charities, discuss their relative merits, and vote to decide which organisation receives the money. They're designed to encourage participants to be intentional, informed and impactful in their giving. Educators and advocates around the world use giving games to teach good giving, and more than 13,000 participants in 25 countries have now taken part. The most common venue for giving games is a university, but they have also been run in primary and secondary schools and in a range of other settings, including conferences, corporate gatherings and religious institutions. Challenging the norm of self-interest When corporations make giving normal behaviour, and when generous people speak openly about how much they give away and share their giving ideas on social media, they do more than encourage others to do the same. They also challenge an assumption about our behaviour that permeates Western and particularly American culture, the norm of self-interest. 
Alexis de Tocqueville, that sharp observer of the American psyche during the formative years of the United States, noticed the norm even then. Americans, he wrote in 1835, enjoy explaining almost every act of their lives on the principle of self-interest. He thought that in doing this they were underplaying their own benevolence, because in his view Americans were, just like everyone else, moved by spontaneous natural impulses to help others. But in contrast to Europeans, Americans, he found, were hardly prepared to admit that they do give way to emotions of this sort. Despite the increasing popularity of philanthropy, in some circles it is still unacceptable to be altruistic, and not only among Americans. Hugh Davidson, who is British, was president of Playtex in Canada and Europe, and has written several successful books on marketing and business management. Although he set up his own philanthropic foundation, he says, If you're a philanthropist, you don't tell your friends you're spending your money on charity. You'd sound damn stupid. As this suggests, many of us believe not only that people are generally motivated by self-interest, but that they ought to be, if not necessarily in the moral sense of ought, then at least in the sense that they would be foolish or irrational if they were not self-interested. Conversely, when people appear to act contrary to their own interests, we tend to be suspicious, especially if the action is carefully considered, as opposed to something impulsive like jumping onto a subway track to save someone from being hit by an oncoming train. When celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Bono, or Amal and George Clooney support organizations that help the poor, we look for hidden selfish reasons. We readily agree with the suggestion that they are doing it only for the publicity. Truly selfless behavior makes us uncomfortable. Perhaps that is why we smile tolerantly at the practice of giving away a lot of money in return for naming rights for a concert hall or a wing of an art gallery. It reassures us that the donor is not really selfless and reinforces our assumptions about human motivation. Several studies have investigated the extent to which we expect that other people will be motivated by self-interest. For example, in one study, students were told about a budget proposal to slash research into an illness that affected only women. Asked to estimate what percentage of men and what percentage of women would oppose the proposal, they greatly overestimated the extent to which attitudes were affected by sex. Similarly, the students assumed that virtually all smokers would oppose tax increases on cigarettes and restrictions on smoking in public places, and that virtually all non-smokers would approve of these measures. In reality, people's attitudes were not as closely linked to their interest or lack of interest in smoking as the students had expected. As psychologist Dale Miller puts it, on these public policy issues, the small actual effects of self-interest stand in sharp relief to the substantial assumed effects of self-interest. Moreover, the students' own attitudes on the issues were often contrary to their interests. For instance, male participants in the study were likely to oppose the proposal to slash research into the women's illness, while at the same time predicting that most men would support it. This leads Miller to explore a puzzle. How is it that people come to embrace the theory of self-interest when everyday life provides so little evidence of it? Miller began his search for the answer to this question with an experiment conducted by economist Robert Frank. At the beginning and end of a semester, Frank asked his students whether they would return a lost envelope containing $100. Students who took an economics course that semester shifted away from returning the envelope. Students who had taken an astronomy course did not. Perhaps the economic students had gained the impression that everyone is motivated by self-interest, 
Economists argue that smokers approve of tax increases on cigarettes because they want to quit, and they hope the taxes will make it easier for them to do so. But you do not need to study economics to be affected by the norm of self-interest. Everyone in a developed society is constantly being bombarded with messages about how to save money, or earn more money, or look better, or gain status, all of which reinforce the assumption that these are things that everyone is pursuing and that really matter. The norm of self-interest is so strong the diversion of it holds even in non-profit organizations that rely on the altruism of volunteers. Psychologists Rebecca Ratner and Jennifer Clark asked volunteers for Students Against Drunk Driving to read applications from two students interested in volunteering for the organization. The applications differed only in that one applicant said that her sister had been killed by a drunk driver, while the other simply said that it is a very important cause. Volunteers were more encouraging and supportive of the applicant whose sister had been killed than they were of the other applicant. Ratner and Clark suggest that this is because they understand her self-interested stake in the cause. They viewed with suspicion the applicant who had a more general, altruistic motivation. In this case, as in many others, suspicion of those with apparently altruistic motives seems counterproductive. The organization is unlikely to achieve its objectives if its support is limited to the relatively small number of people who have experienced a personal tragedy at the hands of a drunk driver. Contrary to what so many of us believe, there is an enormous amount of altruistic, caring behavior in everyday life, even if, for reasons we explored in the previous chapter, not enough of it is directed toward the world's poorest people. However, sociologist Robert Wuthnow found that even people who acted altruistically tended to offer self-interested explanations, sometimes quite implausible ones, for what they had done. They volunteered to work for good causes, they said, because it gave me something to do, or got me out of the house. They were reluctant to say, I wanted to help. Literature is full of characters like Molière's Tartuffe, who pretend to be altruistically motivated when they are really self-seeking. We have a word for them. Hypocrites. But there are fewer literary examples of people who are really altruistic, but pretend to be self-interested, and there is, as far as I know, no single word to describe them. In his book, Acts of Compassion, Wathnau offers a striking real-life example of this type. We don't learn how Jack Casey earns an income, but we are told that he does at least 15 hours a week of volunteer work. He is a member of the local fire department and rescue squad and teaches first aid and outdoor safety courses to schoolchildren. On one rescue, he swam across an icy lake and saved a woman's life. Yet Casey says that his own interests come first. On a rescue mission, I'm number one, my crew is number two, and the patient is number three. When he hears people say that they want to join the rescue squad to help others, Casey says that he knows this isn't the truth. Deep down, everybody has their own selfish reason. They're really doing it for themselves. Wathnau traces Casey's attitude to a reluctance to be seen as a bleeding heart, goody two-shoes, or do-gooder. This reluctance, in turn, comes from social norms against being too charitable, and from our belief that caring is in some ways deviant, the exception rather than the rule. As Wathnau points out, however, so many Americans engage in some volunteer work that it isn't deviant in a statistical sense. It is deviant only in terms of the prevailing norm of self-interest. There is plenty of other evidence all around us that people act from motives other than self-interest. 
They leave tips when dining at restaurants to which they will never return, sometimes even in towns they don't expect to ever visit again. They donate blood to strangers, although that cannot possibly increase their own prospects of getting blood if they should ever need it. They vote in elections when the chance that their vote will tip the balance is vanishingly small. All this suggests that the norm of self-interest is an ideological belief, resistant to refutation by the behaviour we encounter in everyday life. Yet we are enthralled to the idea that it is normal to be self-interested. Since most of us are keen to fit in with everyone else, we tell stories about our acts of compassion that put a self-interested face on them. As a result, the norm of self-interest appears to be confirmed, and so the behaviour continues. The idea is self-reinforcing, and yet socially pernicious. Because if we believe that no one else acts altruistically, we are less likely to do it ourselves. The norm becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When walking in London, Thomas Hobbes, the 17th century philosopher who famously held that all our actions are self-interested, gave a coin to a beggar. His companion, eager to catch the great man out, told Hobbes that he had just refuted his own theory. Not so, Hobbes responded. He gave the money because it pleased him to see the poor man happy. Hobbes thus avoided the refutation of his theory by widening the notion of self-interest so that it is compatible with a great deal of generosity and compassion. That reminds us that there is both a broad and a narrow sense of self-interest. The long-running debate about whether humans are capable of genuine altruism is, in practical terms, less significant than the question of how we understand our own interests. Will we understand them narrowly, concentrating on acquiring wealth and power for ourselves? Do we think that our interests are best fulfilled by conspicuously consuming as many expensive items as possible so that everyone knows that we are rich? Or do we include among our interests the satisfactions that come from helping others? Rob Keldoulis, as we have seen, structured Vivcourt Trading so that 50% of the company's net revenue would go to charity, but he did this because it gave him more of a purpose, and thus greater fulfilment than he had had as a trader just making money for himself. Does this make his actions self-interested? I would not describe him in that way, but if you choose to do so, then I will add that we need more people who are self-interested like that.